So we have the last lecture of uh, Irit about PCP proof. Okay. Hi. Um, so, so today we will uh, finish proving that uh, uh, we have a reduction from uh, uh, from uh, an instance of graph coloring G. Uh, so this is uh, instance of three coloring uh, 2H. And this is also an instance of three coloring. but such that uh, the gap is amplified. So if, uh, if G is a three color of a, then H is three color of a, and if uh, G is not three color of a, meaning every coloring makes at least one edge see the same colors on both endpoints, then H is epsilon uh, uh, not three, or let's say epsilon far from being three colorable. More precisely, every coloring of the vertices of H uh, cause at least epsilon fraction of the edges to be monochromatic to see the same color on both endpoints. So we had this notation of the unsat value of H. Here it's zero, meaning everything, all the edges are satisfiable. And here the unsat value of H is at least epsilon. Okay, this is for a uh, this whole thing is for some constant epsilon. Okay, so uh, we said that uh, this reduction will be done by a sequence of transformations. We start with G, and we show a sequence of polynomial time transformation, G1, G2, until we get to G, uh, something like log N, and this will be H where uh, each transformation from GI to GI plus one uh, will be, will have the following properties. First of all, this, uh, if uh, GI was perfectly colorable, the unsat is zero, okay, uh, of GI, then the unsat of GI plus one is also going to be zero. Um, if the unsat of GI is, uh, is above zero, let's denote it by some uh, epsilon, then uh, the unsat of GI plus one is going to be more than uh, two epsilon. Uh, okay, yeah, let's call it delta. Delta, then it's going to be more than two delta, unless uh, already above epsilon. <laughs> okay, so uh, we continue to increase this unset value until we reach some epsilon, and then you still need to prove that you don't decrease it, but that will be easy, so we ignore it just increase and increase until you've reached the constant. So even if you reach the constant uh, here, that's fine, because we'll have. Uh, and very importantly too, the size of uh, GI plus one is no more than a constant times the size of GI. 
And this last part is important because uh, we start with an instance of size uh, n, and we start applying this transformation. Um, every time we multiply by a constant, and we do it logarithmically many times, so at the end we multiply by a constant to the log n, which is okay, it's just a polynomial factor. Anything bigger than a constant here would result in a super polynomial reduction, we can't afford it. And the reason I stress this is because uh, by parallel repetition it's uh, straightforward to amplify some delta into uh, two delta, but the problem is that the size of the instance squares, and we can't afford to repeatedly square because then h will be exponential size. So instead we do what I referred to as a de-randomized, a form of de-randomized parallel repetition, uh, which I describe next. So, uh, now I'm going to talk just about the transformation from GI to GI plus one, and it has uh, three steps. The first step is some kind of a, a, a beautification, okay, I don't know how to call it. Uh, it's just a kind of arranging uh, the graph GI in a way that will be convenient for us. In particular, you make, uh, so you know what, uh, let's call uh, let's call it, uh, let's call these two graphs, okay, I'll actually leave it, I'll change the names later. Make GI I have a, a constant, constant degree D, so regular, uh, and, uh, and expanding. So this is uh, actually easy to do. Uh, when you uh, apply this transformation to do this, you might lose a little bit in the parameters, but it's uh, not important, so let's just ignore it and assume that the graph we started with was a regular, a deregular graph for constant D and that it was a, a weak, or an expander. Okay. Uh, and then in fact, uh, these transformations uh, maintain this property. So uh, I prefer not to worry about this at all. Okay, so I'm putting an X, I'm not going to talk about it. The next step is the, uh, is the gap amplification uh, by uh, some kind of uh, de-randomized parallel repetition. In the last step, so I described this yesterday, I will do it again today, and uh, you take a three coloring instance and you convert it into a CSP instance that's no longer a, a three coloring instance. You convert it into a graph with labels and the constraints check that the labels are consistent. And it's no longer a three coloring uh, instance and the last step is to convert it into a three coloring instance. And the most important part is that the labels in the graph you obtain here are big. Their size, to describe a label you need to give something like, uh, you need to tell the colors of an entire neighborhood so it's, the number of bits is like the size of the neighborhood, it's a lot. You want to convert it back into a three coloring instance, so we call this alphabet reduction. It's the alphabet of the constraints. So in parentheses I'll say back to three coloring. If you don't do this, there's no way to repeat this operation because I promised uh, in the sequence of GI to GI plus one that it's a three coloring graph every time and I must return to a three coloring instance. So the alphabet reduction is done by a, a what's called the composition. So we'll discuss this. Okay, so. Uh, Already to say, I feel that uh, uh, this part is kind of uh, natural and easy to understand. 
This part is also, it's not, it's also natural, but somehow to explain composition uh, well, uh, composition is better understood not as, uh, not when you think of all these things as CSPs and gadgets and stuff, but rather when you think of them in the classical form of PCP as a verifier and a proof and so on. And uh, jumping between these two views, although they're just a syntactical transformation, so you can think of them as trivial, they really, far from trivial, it requires different uh, ways to think of these things, and this is complicated, so I won't be able to, to do it. I will just kind of explain the idea, and uh, just say also that I feel that this is, uh, there is more to exploit in this area. That if we knew how to use composition better in other ways, we could probably get more. Uh, yeah, but this is just a feeling, I might be wrong. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start with, uh, with this, the gap amplification. Ah, actually one more thing before we start with this, I want to say uh, a kind of uh, another intuitive thing. Uh, so think of uh, the graph G, so let's do it here. So I have my original graph uh, GI. For now I'm going to call it G and the next graph is going to be G prime. Okay, so this is what used to be GI and this is GI plus one. I just don't want to keep carrying this index with me. Okay. So I have my G and uh, you know, it has vertices and edges and so on. And there is some fraction of edges that no matter how you color G, these fraction remain uh, 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 badly colored. Okay, in the beginning it's, it's maybe one edge. And then after one step, what you do is each vertex, as we said, looks at its neighborhood and somehow incorporates the data about all of its neighbors into its own uh, private information. And this somehow causes the vertex to know a little bit more about the graph. And it causes the fraction of edges that uh, are unsatisfied to grow, right? So this is the amplification step. Somehow each vertex looks a little bit outside, collects information, and it gets uh, in the, the bugs, wherever they were, get spread out a little bit. And, uh, and then in the second step of alphabet reduction, you take each vertex that was now very big and fat because it contained a lot of bits, and you disperse it back into many little uh, vertices. And the way you convert back to a three coloring instance is by dispersing. Okay, so this is kind of a process of uh, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. Every time you do this one step, the bugs, uh, their location propagates along the graph. And when you do it a logarithm, since the graph is an expander, you know, intuitively, it takes a logarithmically many steps to converge so that this one bug will kind of propagate everywhere. And so you need to do this breathing process log n times and if there was a bug, it now uh, propagated everywhere. So this is a kind of a intuitive uh, thing to keep in mind. The yoga version. The yoga version, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we do the breathing in part, which is the gap amplification, right? So we move from uh, G to G prime. And what we said is that every vertex in uh, G prime will be exactly the same as the vertices in G, except that now the label for this vertex is going to be bigger. It will contain not only the color of this V, but the colors of all of its neighbors at distance, say, something like T. Okay, so I was asked uh, this morning, uh, how do I know that this uh, neighborhood is even small? It might be that this vertex is the neighbor of all of the graph, right? And then the neighborhood is huge. So in the first step, we took care of the fact that the graph will have a constant degree. So I know that my neighborhood is just, has a size, uh, uh, so I have D neighbors and then D squared neighbors at distance two. So D to the T neighbors in my neighborhood. Okay, so uh, uh, yeah, let's write something down here. So, uh,
So, so the label just encodes the coloring to your entire uh, T neighborhood. And now uh, the edges, we said uh, according to a, a length T wax, say. So it's just like taking the adjacency matrix of G, raising it to the power of T. Now you will have an edge between two vertices if they had a walk of length T between them. And, uh, and uh, so that's how these are the edges of G prime. And the constraints just check uh, local consistency. So a constraint between a vertex U and a vertex V just checks that the, looks at the common neighborhood of U and V, all the vertices that both U and V see. This is a subgraph of this graph. It's just a small subgraph. And the labels of U and V together give you a coloring of this subgraph. And the constraint just checks that this coloring is perfectly legal. So that if U says that the color of some common neighbor is uh, one, then V says the same thing. And that this coloring is a legal free coloring of this local environment. Okay, so. Uh, Uh, check local consistency. Okay, so clearly, uh, so this is the construction. So now, it's a multigraph. Yeah, it's a multigraph, or you can think of it as a graph with weights on the edges. Okay. Yeah. So how do the weights come in? Okay, thanks, yeah, so how do the weights come in? I'm, I, my claim is going to be that if uh, there is some fraction of bad edges here, there is some fraction, bigger fraction of bad edges here, and when I say fraction, I mean according to this distribution. Okay, so maybe multigraph is more concrete way to think of it. You just, you know, duplicate the constraints uh, so to ensure that the fraction is what you want. Okay. Uh, so, right, so this is what I want to claim next. So the first thing is that if uh, the ansat of G uh, was zero, you know, you could f perfectly color this entire thing, then you can perfectly label this thing so that uh, all the constraints are satisfied. With weighted edges. Oh, weighted edges. Multigraph means, uh, you can either think of it as multigraph or weighted edges. So maybe multigraph, so forget the weights. It's a multigraph. So, so the edge from B to B has weight to the number of half of length T from B to B? Perfect, yeah, yeah. And so vertices of G prime are the same as G. Are the same as G, okay. So, but to your question, so G is a coloring instance. G prime is not a coloring instance, it's a graph. And also, there's this notion of labels for the vertices and constraints on the edges. So it's a, it's a graph that the, so you keep the same vertices and you put an edge between V and V prime if you have uh, a length T path between them. But here it's not a proper coloring problem, it's a somewhat different. You assign, it's a constraint satisfaction problem. You assign to each vertex, not just one color, but actually picture of what the local neighborhood could look like. And, and the consistency condition is what determines when an edge is located. In other words, when I say this statement, I mean G is three colorable. When I say this statement, what I mean is you can assign a picture to each uh, vertex such that the pictures are, are, local, are consistent. And this is uh, immediate from the construction. It was just constructed in a way that if you translate the, local, the, three, the perfect three coloring here into something here, everything will, uh, will work out. So it's immediate from the construction. The second part is, the, is always the more difficult thing to prove, and that if the ansat of G is some uh, equals delta, which is non-zero, 
Then we claim that the, the, the unset of G prime, again, here the unset of G prime is no matter how you assign pictures to each vertex, labels to each vertex, we count what is the fraction of edges that are unhappy. That's the unset value. And this is going to be uh, bigger than some, say, T times delta. So I'm going to be very inaccurate in, in terms of constants and so on, and the distribution, I, I don't have time to go into these details, so I'll just say it kind of very roughly. But very roughly, it will grow by factor of T. Uh, yes, this is the place where I need the expanding property. I will say it next. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let me, does it do together? So uh, to, to see the second property, this is what I want to prove. So first of all, note that if, if G is indeed an expander and you l take a random length T walk, which corresponds to a random uh, edge in G prime, right? So a random edge in G prime is exactly a random length T walk in G, okay? So now uh, think of a random length T walk in G. If in G you kind of color or you, know, you mark some delta fraction of the edges. Those are the bad edges. And you ask yourself, if I take a random length T walk, so I take a random vertex and then I walk T steps from it. How many times do, or what's the probability that I expect to even meet one of these delta edges? So if I just take a random edge, I expect to meet it with probability delta. If I take T independently random edges, I expect to meet one of these delta things with probability T times delta. And now I'm saying, look, don't take T independently random edges, take them in a path on G. So they are certainly dependent, but yet because G is an expander, the probability to meet one of these delta marked edges is about T times delta. Okay, so this is the, uh, one of the properties of an expander, it's not hard to prove. Okay, so let me just write it. Uh, if uh, G is an expander, okay, when I say expander, uh, you know what, doesn't matter what, I, <laughs> what, what exactly I mean. What I mean is the, is the next property that I will write. Uh, and, uh, and E star is a subset of the edges of G. Of G. Okay, G is a V comma E. Okay, so you have some E star whose cardinality is a delta E. Okay, then, uh, then the probability, probability that a, a random a path gamma, so gamma is of length T, uh, hits uh, E star, means, meaning, so gamma is a path of uh, T consecutive edges. The probability that one of these edges is in E star is, uh, uh, you know, so it's a delta times T. So of course this can't be true when delta is too big, right? Because then this is more than one. But, okay, I'm only claiming it for small delta. Okay, so this is a good thing for us, right? Because uh, at least intuitively, E star is going to be the set of edges where you have a problem, where you can't color the graph properly. And a, a random path gamma is exactly like a random constraint in the, in the bigger, in the new graph, G prime. And so the probability that this random path at least has a problem on it, is T times delta, and that's a good thing because we want to see, you, we want to increase the probability of having a problem. This is our T delta from right here. Right, so, so this is uh, the property we need from the expander, and now uh, let's try to actually prove this thing. So uh, I want to prove that the unset value of G prime is uh, something. I have to look at, you know, so I have to look at some 
labeling of G prime. So fix some labeling. Let's call it capital A. Okay, so uh, okay, so I have a labeling. A gives for every vertex in G prime uh, this local picture of, of the coloring. And now I want to deduce from capital A some uh, labeling for, uh, for G, for the original G. So that, you know, uh, if, uh, if capital A satisfied too many of the edges, I will reach a contradiction. So one way is to say, well, look, if, what's the natural way to do capital A? You take some original coloring of G, and you just assign pictures consistently according to this, uh, this original coloring. Okay? But then you will really run into trouble because any original coloring little a, if you have some little a coloring of G, it has some places where the edges are falsified. So for, for the vertices that see those edges in, its local, in their local neighborhood, these vertices won't be able to say, I'm coloring these two adjacent vertices yellow, right? Because they will see that this is a problem. So maybe they will lie and say something else, okay? So in general, uh, capital A can, be, can do anything. Certainly it can lie and, and not be consistent with one underlying assignment. And yet our goal in the proof is to deduce some underlying coloring for G, and we'll do it by taking some kind of majority vote. Okay, so uh, this is what we do. We, we say, uh, we define uh, A, this is a labeling, a labeling, or it's a coloring. For G, by uh, plurality. Namely, if you look at the vertex U, and you want to know what it's going to be, it's coloring according to little a, well then, you know, U occurs in many of the neighborhoods of its uh, neighbors, and each neighbor maybe gives you a different color. U asks all of its neighbors, you know, what do you think my color should be? And the color that appears more, most often, that's the color you will select. Okay, so this is like a polling thing. Uh, you will ask its neighbors what, what its color is and choose the most uh, common color, okay? So, uh, you calls neighbors for its color. Okay, because capital A uh, gives all of U's neighbors a value that also encodes U co use color. So use color occurs many places and uh, you can do this. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm being a loose here. So uh, neighbors uh, up to distance t. And really, I'm, you know, since I'm not going to go into the full details, I don't have time for it. So there is, you have to be a little bit careful about the distribution. Really what you need to do is take a random walk at a certain distance or according to a certain distribution. And uh, so it gives different neighbors different weights and according to that this, uh, define its, uh, the plurality. But I prefer to ignore it. Is it really necessary that P should be large or T2 equals Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Can, can you really just do T equals two or, or five? So for one thing is I need T to be large because when T is large, I get a factor of T times delta. And later in my steps one and three, I will lose a constant factor. So uh, and then I will want to claim that, okay, whatever constant factor I lost, I'll just choose T large enough so that this turns out to be two times delta all in all. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so from this, we get a new, uh, from, from our uh, labeling to G prime, we got this labeling, uh, uh, this coloring for G, and we know that just like any other coloring, this coloring A. Uh, Sorry, how did you get the labeling for G of G prime? No, so I, right, so I just assumed someone gave me a labeling for G prime, no matter what labeling. Okay. Now I will do a sequence of things, and I will prove that this labeling must have many uh, falsified edges. So what is the labeling? Is just the data of uh, coloring for neighborhoods? Yeah, for each vertex you give a coloring of its neighborhood. That's a labeling. 
So my goal, kind of the way we want to prove this second statement, okay, so I'm just uh, trying to prove this uh, implication. And the way I will do it is I say, okay, I want to prove that this holds. Give me any labeling for G prime, I will show you that it's uh, unsatisfying at least T times delta uh, fraction. So maybe, yeah, maybe I'll write it here. Uh, we will show delta T fraction of bad uh, edges in G prime, according to this A. Okay, and uh, so now I got my coloring little a. I know it falsifies some delta fraction of the edges because every coloring does that for G. And I want to uh, analyze this situation, right? So see if I can, uh, I guess I'll just copy this graph again, right? So I have my, my graph G, and I know that some delta fraction of the edges are falsified. Okay, now I select a, a random edge in G prime. What's a random edge in G prime? It's a random length T walk. It's a random length T, oh, sorry. T walk in, uh, in G, right? So suppose this is G, and I choose a random edge in G prime, that's just like saying I, I'm choosing a random length T walk in G, and somewhere in the middle is this uh, falsified edge. Okay, let's call its endpoints uh, u prime and v prime. Okay, so what does it mean for this edge to be falsified? It means that uh, a, little a, the coloring of u prime equals a of v prime. So it's a bad, bad coloring, right? Because the colors should always be different. Okay, and I want to show, what I want to claim is that if this happens for u v, uh, then it means with constant probability that also the label of U, the local picture of U and the local picture of V are inconsistent. And so this whole, uh, the edge in G prime that corresponds to this path will be bad. Okay, so the, the way proof will go is step one is this. Uh, probability that a random path sees this set of bad edges is delta T. And the second step, is going to be if uh, 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 choose a random path uh, of length t in G conditioned on containing an edge, edge from E star, uh, and then the probability, probability of uh, the corresponding constraint in G prime to be false is constant. So I'm cheating here because I'm not uh, you know, worrying exactly about the probabilities, but let's, let's just ignore it for now. Uh, okay, so E star, okay, so we defined A and then let, I didn't write that, I'm thinking of E star uh, B, the edges, uh, uh, the monochromatic edges of A, be the mono, of A, of, sorry, little a. Okay, so it's indeed E star has size delta, like in my assumption, right? Because this is my assumption about G. Okay, so now, I will try to convince you of this fact, but first let's see what, what it means. By the first statement, just the fact that G is an expander, we know that about delta T fraction of the paths, C an edge in E star. And for each of these paths, I know that from the second statement, so we have a path that contains an edge from E star. 
And then I know from this statement that it, with constant probability, it will also, uh, this, the constraint corresponding to this path will be falsified. So altogether, you see that you have a constant times delta t probability of a uh, constraint in G prime being falsified. Okay, and that will uh, complete the proof of this uh, soundness. And w what's the reason for this thing? So uh, look at this picture. So you have a path here, and you know that the plurality, the, the, the coloring in the little a colors according to plurality, and the plurality gives u prime and v prime inconsistent colors. They color this edge in the same color, so it's inconsistent. And now you ask yourself, well, u, since u gives some value of a local picture that contains both u and v prime, u certainly doesn't agree with the plurality either on u prime or on v prime. Right, because you won't say something that's locally inconsistent. And similarly V, right? So you probably says uh, on one of them, so let's choose V prime. So suppose you use local picture, says a value for V prime that's inconsistent with the plurality value. And now think of uh, continuing this path uh, randomly in all possible ways from here, okay? So, uh, how do you choose the plurality value of V prime? It was just by taking random paths, asking all of the neighbors what they think of V prime, and the value that occurs more, most often, that's the value V prime will get, right? So it means that a constant fraction of these paths, say one over three of them, because there's three possible values, so the, the plurality occurs in probability at least one third. So at least one third of these uh, paths give V the plurality value. Give, sorry, give V prime the plurality value, a value that disagrees with you. So are these paths, if, if we look at this path, then the vertex here thinks that V prime is a plurality value. U thinks that V prime is not a plurality value, so this path will reject. So in other words, a constant fraction of these paths will reject, so, and the probability that the one we started with will, was one of them is a constant. So this is kind of a hand-waving, uh, argument to, to say that this uh, that this holds. Okay, this blue tiles of length t, so there might be human of no. Again? These blue tiles that you just added. Yeah, from here they're green. Uh, <laughs> they're length t, so they're not already not in the side of you. Uh, yeah, exactly. So Matt is pointing out to a flaw in this whole argument that I'm trying to cheat. Right, so he's saying, look, uh, uh, the plurality is defined by walking in length t, but you're now walking maybe length t over two, so it's a different distribution, and you need to make sure that these two distributions are the same. Right, so, uh, right, so this, this means that I need to define my, the distribution of my walks a bit more carefully, and I'm trying to hide this. But, uh, they're not exactly length t. The best way to do it is to say at each step with probability one over t, I stop. Or I continue, and then, yeah. This is a, this kind of this uh, improvement is due to uh, the length is geometric. due to Jaikuma. Yeah, it's a geometric. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, any other questions before I uh, move on? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Where, which board to use now? Uh, yeah, so let's move back to this board. Okay, so now I want to do, so we kind of uh, uh, tried to convince you that this thing holds so that the second step uh, is proven. We managed to get a delta gap between zero and delta to a bigger gap between zero and t times delta. And of course now my problem is that uh, the instance I've constructed here is not a three coloring, right? It's this consistent picture instance. You want to, it's some constraint satisfaction problem and now I want to convert it back to a three coloring. And this is a, this is a big problem, right? Uh, And the idea would be to replace every 
constraint over these local pictures by some bunch of uh, small constraints. Right, so think of the, think of the two vertices in, uh, in G prime, vertex U and get some label alpha, and vertex V get some label beta, and the constraint checks that alpha and beta are consistent. So what is alpha? Alpha is nothing but the colors of all of U's neighbors at distance T. So it's alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha D to the T. It's all the possible neighbors at distance T. And beta is just, you know, beta one, beta two, all the way up to beta D to the T for all the neighbors of V at distance T. And the constraint that you're checking, let's call this constraint uh, some phi, if phi is some constraint, and it's a function from uh, this to zero or one, right? Zero if you're not satisfied, one if, if you are satisfied. What does phi check? Phi is really looking at the subgraph of the original G defined by the joint neighborhood of U and V of distance T. It's a subgraph of G, so something here. Let's call this subgraph G of U V. So where phi is looking at this subgraph, and it wants to know if this set of colors, this is just a sequence of numbers from one to three, okay, these numbers, if they are a legal coloring and if they are consistent. So, you know, maybe, you know, this part of the vertices uh, occur both in the neighborhood of U and in the neighborhood of V, right? So, I mean, some part of the neighborhood overlaps. So it means that V gives colors to the same guys as does U. And so phi needs to check that alpha two equals beta seven, alpha, alpha three equals beta eight, and so on. And also that this whole thing is a legal coloring of GUV. Okay, so phi, phi just checks say, phi equals one if and only if uh, alpha is consistent with beta and uh, legal coloring. Legally color G, U, V. Okay, this is the constraint phi. Okay, and so phi is a constraint over many, uh, many bits. Okay. Uh, now what I would like to do is take phi and convert it into a bunch of coloring constraints over just, you know, uh, a bunch of constraints that each constraint just gets two colors and says, you know, I, I only accept when they're different. So that uh, uh, I retain the probability of rejection. So what I want, goal is uh, convert phi into some, uh, you know, C1 up to Cm. A local constraints. You know, they, they can be coloring constraints. Uh, think of, uh, of inequality, for example, uh, with the following property that if the assignment to uh, alpha and beta was satisfying for phi, then all of the CIs will accept. Uh, such that if the uh, local constraints say over, over the, these variables alpha, beta, such that if phi of alpha, beta was one, then all uh, CIs accept. And if phi of alpha, beta uh, was zero, then, uh, you know, at least, uh, at least some, uh, uh, you know, 0 0.1 or some constant fraction, let's call it, uh, what letter do I have? <laughs> Gamma fraction of CIs uh, reject. Okay, if I manage to do this, then I will uh, replace each of these fees by these CIs. I will get this new instance, uh, uh, f from uh, G prime, I'll get this new instance, but now with my original coloring constraints. And I will know that the fraction of, reject of rejecting CIs is the fraction of rejecting edges in G prime many times this gamma. And that will be fine. That will be the end of it. Now the, the problem is that uh, I'm not sure how to do this, right? In fact, as stated, it's impossible. So 
how would you convert a predicate that's a complicated predicate over uh, you know, n bits or some number of uh, bits into a bunch of local predicates that uh, have a property that if the entire thing is satisfied, then uh, all, the all the constraints are satisfied, and if the entire thing is not satisfied, a constant fraction of the constraints are not satisfied. Okay? So one thing you can do is say, well, look, phi itself has been defined by a bunch of local constraints. I mean, to check this, to check whether phi is one, it's very easy. You go edge by edge in G U V and check that the edge is, is satisfied. And also you go for the ones that need to be equal, you just check equality. So all these things are local constraints. So that's something you can do. The problem is that this doesn't guarantee when phi is not satisfied, doesn't guarantee that a constant fraction of your constraint will be falsified. It only guarantees that one of them will be falsified. Right? So that's, maybe you already realize that this is, brought us back to the original PCP problem. Right? We started out, we wanted to check whether a graph is three callable or not, in a way that the checks are local, and that if it was not locally, if it was not three callable, a constant fraction of our things will reject. And now we come back to this coloring problem again. We also have this equality, but ignore it. And again, we want to check that this whole predicate uh, reject or not uh, locally in a way that a constant fraction of our local checks need to, re to reject. Okay, so we came back to the same problem. And this is exactly uh, where composition comes in because now you can say, hey, this is the same problem but it's over a much smaller instance and I'm able to, uh, to apply some uh, easier PCP theorem just on this part, okay? So, uh, uh, this is, it's not exactly, but let's say very similar to the original PCP uh, uh, question. Or, or to, in other words, to, uh, to the redu reduction we wanted to come up with in the, in the first place, to, or to our initial goal. Okay, and it's impossible to do this way. Uh, you can uh, convince yourself that if these constraints are only all over alpha beta, they cannot be local. Uh, I think I hinted about this uh, already in previous talk. But uh, what you can do is add some um, extra variables. There is nothing to prevent you from doing that. So it's like adding a proof. Okay, so you add some more variables. Um, and you have the CIs be constraints not over just uh, alpha and beta, but over also some additional uh, variables, uh, I don't know, uh, pi i. And then you can really do this. So uh, you add some extra variables, pi one to pi m, and uh, you're able to, uh, to do this. Now, how, how are we able to solve the, this problem? So the issue is that uh, since we reduced to this uh, coloring problem, which is what we started with, on a much smaller scale, so now the, the whole size of this input is just uh, two times d to the t. Okay, so, you know, so maybe it's a big uh, constant, but it's just a constant. It's independent of the size of the entire instance. So we can uh, apply a, a PCP transformation of this form that has a exponential size, similar to what I talked about in my first talk uh, about taking all possible subsets of the, of the variables and say, well, this is an exponential size proof. So we will do something like that, an exponential size proof, but it will be exponential in a constant, just be another constant. Okay, so it will, uh, what will happen is that C1 plus CM will just be some, uh, a constant number of constraints where the, the number of constraints does depend on T, but the fraction of CIs that reject will just be a constant that does not depend on T. Okay, and this is the point. Right. So this is what uh, we will do. So now you do the telephone building. The telephone building, yeah. Except, now is this board a board that goes up? Yeah, I guess it does. Uh, 
Voilà, ça va ça, c'est ça. Except that there is a one kind of very important issue. So let me use this picture again. So I, I had this predicate uh, phi over uh, the labels alpha and beta. And I managed to convert phi into a bunch of uh, local constraints over uh, alpha, beta, and some extra variables pi. But now I need to convert not only phi, but also, you know, so this is g prime, but also, so this was like u and v, and maybe I have u and w, and I need to also convert this phi. So this is phi u v, I also need to convert phi u w, I need to do it for all the possible constraints in g prime. <coughs> And if I convert phi into a bunch of constraints, and I convert this into a bunch of constraints, and so on, it seems that uh, these different conversions have nothing to do with each other, and there's no way for me to verify consistency. And so this is a problem that uh, uh, is at the heart of composition, how, how to do it in a way that ensures consistency, and Parad will talk about it today uh, in the afternoon. Uh, so. I, won't go into it, but there is a way to do it. And as I said in the beginning of my talk, it's not hard to understand, it's just more convenient to think of it in the language of this prover verifier uh, setting. So now I just want to uh, summarize. So uh, look at the, uh, okay, let's look first at this board. So uh, step one we didn't discuss, it causes me to lose a constant factor. Step two causes me to gain a factor of t. And step three again causes me to lose a constant factor. So I just choose t appropriately and get a, a constant factor. And then, um, I, uh, and then this, uh, the scheme that's up in the board on the first board will indeed work and you get this doubling of the unset value uh, every time. Okay, so to finish, uh, okay, so this, uh, this completes uh, uh, the proof or the sketch of the proof. So just to kind of to summarize uh, what we've seen. So uh, uh, we saw in uh, NP hardness of the gap uh, one comma one minus epsilon uh, three coloring. Okay, we saw that it's empty hard to decide if a graph is perfectly three colorable or no more than one minus epsilon. Then, uh, so this is what, what we finished to see today. Uh, we also showed that this implies uh, easily to get a gap of uh, one comma one minus epsilon, maybe it's a different epsilon, it doesn't matter, a uh, label cover. Okay, and I showed this, I think, yesterday. It's just uh, an immediate uh, gadget reduction, it's trivial. And, uh, and then, uh, by parallel repetition, so this is, uh, uh, one will talk about it. Uh, you get a gap of uh, one comma epsilon, and this can go to zero and be as small as you want. Uh, oh, maybe I forgot to say, gap this is NP hard. Uh, label cover also is empty hard. Okay. And from this, uh, you know, follow a lot of the hardness of approximation results that uh, Ryan has been talking about and the others. And of course, then there is this uh, big uh, unknown gap between this and the uh, uh, unique games uh, conjecture which is also uh, this kind of label cover, maybe with uh, imperfect completeness, but with very specific constraints. Okay, so this is what we know to do, NP hardness, and uh, okay. Any questions? Uh, 
uh, we can see, uh, we, we can consider proofs in uh, the PCP protocol as a, some kind of error correcting code. Right. And uh, it is uh, locally testable. What is known about this Hamming distance? Is it known that it is uh, locally decodable in, in a reasonable sense? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I didn't discuss these things at all, but there's a, a strong connection between coding and these things, and there are two related notions. One is locally testable code, one is locally decodable code. Um, it's not locally decodable. Uh, PCP constructions give rise to locally <laughs> testable codes, but the analogy isn't perfect, and uh, so this is something I'm very interested in. And there are a lot of uh, things that are not well understood in this analogy, because sometimes the PCP proofs don't have good distance, although you would think that they should, but they don't, so, yeah. Any other questions? So in fact, I do have one. Uh, what is the best epsilon for uh, circularability? Oh, I don't know this answer, so Venkat knows, uh, uh, right? Three coloring, yeah. <laughs> so it's not known to be optimal. And so what do we need to prove exactly in order to get a specific constant like that? So uh, there is this uh, beautiful result of Prasad that shows that uh, under the unique gains conjecture, if you have an integrality gap, it, it translates to a hardness result. And it means that the algorithm in the, in the hardness are tight. But this is under unique gains. Yes, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Let's thank you again.